Public discussions around sex were traditionally something of a taboo subject in Ireland. Indeed, the country was well known as one of the most conservative democracies in Europe in the 20th century. However, even in light of this, the history and attitudes of the authorities towards contraception still shocks many. Believe it or not, through much of the 20th century, contraception of all kinds was banned in Ireland. So extreme was the attitude towards contraception that not only were things like condoms and IUDs banned, but even literature about family planning was censored. Now, in this podcast, I interviewed Dr. Laura Kelly, a senior lecturer in the history of health and medicine in the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Laura is an expert in this area, and she explains why the government banned contraception, what the far-reaching consequences of this ban were on Irish society, particularly Irish women, and how it was eventually overturned. It's an astonishing and often unbelievable story from the relatively recent past. Just before you hear from Laura, I'll get the intros out of the way. If you're a new listener, my name is Finn Dwyer and this is the Irish History Podcast. If you're new to the show and you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to subscribe. If you're trying to find somewhere to dive into the back catalogue, you might enjoy the three-part series Ireland's Last Aristocrat, the story of Olive Packen and Mahan. You'll find that just from a few weeks back. If you want to find more of Laura's work, I have links to her Twitter profile, and our academic profile at Strathclyde University in the show notes below as well. Finally, next week I'll be launching something I've been working away on for the past while. So back in 2016, I wrote a book on the Black Death. Recent events, not just the pandemic, but the political chaos and the increasing problems we face today, drew me back to the 14th century, because there are strange, often unsettling echoes of that past in the present. Back in the 14th century, our ancestors also faced huge social and political instability, pandemics, and despite the passage of time, human reactions over those centuries are surprisingly similar. Now, after rereading that book I wrote six years ago, I decided it could do with a new edit, so I've reduced it down to a more concise audiobook that lasts about two and a half hours. I've just finished the final recordings of that, and along with superb additional narrations from Aidan Crow, it's a pretty fascinating history of a very different time, yet one you can but notice some similarities to. Now this new version of The Black Death in Ireland is launching on November the 7th. It's two and a half hours of uninterrupted audio, broken into nine chapters with no ads that transports you back to the late Middle Ages. If the prospect of the World Cup coming up doesn't excite you, well, this is something entirely different. It's pure escapism. It costs $5.99 and you'll be able to buy this as a one-off purchase. You don't need to sign up to anything to get this audiobook. And the best thing about it is that you'll also be able to get it in your podcast app. You won't need to sign up to some audiobook service either to download it. So watch out for this in the coming days. I'll be able to tell you where you can get it and how you can get it. It's coming on November the 7th. Now to the show. Before we talked about the banning of contraception in Ireland, I asked Laura to explain what forms of contraception existed in the early 20th century prior to anything being banned. Yeah, before the ban in 1935, it still would have been pretty difficult to get access to contraception in Ireland. But we do know from primary sources from the time that there were actually rubber goods or condoms available and there was a black market around this. Particularly in Dublin in the 1920s, you see this and there's quite a lot of concern about this from, you know, more more conservative members of the public. And it would have also been possible for people to obtain contraceptives by mail order as well, or from from the UK. Um, There were a lot of concerns that there was this kind of market between Ireland and Britain in this period as well. But obviously saying that this all really heavily depended on class at the time as well. We also know that there were some chemists in Dublin and Cork that um, supplied condoms as well. So for example, in 1972, there's a letter in the National Archives from a man called uh, Keith Joseph Adams, and he wrote to Taoiseach Jack Lynch in 1972, and just to kind of outline you know, his recollections of the 1920s and what was happening then um, in relation to contraception in Ireland. 
So Adams had basically worked as an assembler in a sundries department for a pharmaceutical wholesale company. And he basically dealt with kind of medical goods and recalled him and a colleague um, supplying four or five chemists in Dublin with rubber goods or condoms in the 1920s uh, leading up to the 1930s. We also know that there were publications on birth control available. And so some of the bookshops in Dublin, for example, Eason's actually stocked publications relating to birth control in the 1920s, early 30s. And we also know that there was demand for birth control from Irish men and women in this period because the Welcome Library in London has the Mary Stopes archive, and that has actually lots of letters from Irish men and women who were writing to Stopes, just asking for kind of basic information about where they could get contraception in this period. So I think it it was available, but quite difficult to actually access it in this time period as well. So contraception was banned in 1935. I asked Laura why the government went down this path. I guess when you've got the Irish Free State established uh, in 1922, you've got, you know, lots of legislation coming in that's really influenced by Catholic teachings at the time. And I suppose really after Irish independence, the country is trying to just mould itself into a kind of a more moral and Catholic and pure country. So as to distinguish itself from, from Britain, really, in this period. So really what you see at this time is like motherhood and family were really elevated in status under the Irish Free State. And women were really crucial to this thinking that, you know, Ireland was this very pure and virtuous nation. So even though women had played a really important role in the struggle for Irish independence, they, there was this idea that, you know, they needed to be returned to the home from the 1920s. And, you know, you see a lot of legislation coming in from then on, you know, that kind of blocks them from really being able to engage in the kind of politics and the economics of, of the country. So, yeah, so I suppose then like some of the legislation that's important that comes in, one of the key acts is the 1929 Censorship of Publications Act. and Basically, this comes out of a committee that meets in 1926 called the Evil Literature Committee. And basically, they're really concerned that, you know, there's this British birth control propaganda circulating uh, around the country, but particularly in Dublin. And the members of the committee were really concerned that this literature was obscene and that it would encourage sexual activity outside of marriage. So um, this is a big issue at the time. So basically this committee, their discussions lead to the 1929 Act and that bans any obscene literature. And that includes, you know, not just books or publications on birth control, but even books that have basic information on fertility or, you know, the female reproductive cycle, anything like that is banned. So that's a really important piece of legislation in, in relation to contraception and kind of just banning any information um, from being circulated about it. So people don't have access to information after this. And then the second piece of legislation that's really important is the Criminal Law Amendment Act, which comes in in 1935. And again, this comes out of a committee. And so the Carrigan Committee, which re- produced a report in 1931, and basically the Carrigan Committee were concerned that contraceptives seemed to be available in a lot of the country. And really their report linked contraception to, you know, these ideas of around sexual promiscuity, concerns about, you know, things like venereal disease and all of this. And they also drew attention to the circulation of adverts relating to birth control in the country and also this, you know, trade that was going on between Ireland and Britain. So really the Criminal Law Amendment Act in 1935, it's coming out of the Carrigan Committee and it's banning the sale, import or advertisements of contraceptions from for contraceptive from, from 1935. So that's really important as well. And like that ban then is in place obviously till 1979. So it has a huge impact on men and women for much of the 20th century. Introducing a ban on contraception is one thing, but I asked Laura if they actually prosecuted people. Yeah, you actually see that kind of from 1935 onwards. There's quite a few cases in Dublin in particular of chemists being prosecuted for the sale or import of contraceptives in in this period. But obviously it's very very difficult to 
regulated on on a personal level you know and you know obviously there are still people you know maybe going over to the UK possibly bringing contraceptives back but yeah it does kind of all of these cases which are widely reported in the newspapers and in the 30s I think it does kind of it is effective in scaring people that you know they might be prosecuted for this so so they are the, the government does put this into effect after 35 yeah By the late 1930s, contraception was completely banned. Laura went on to explain the impact that this had on all aspects of life, particularly women's lives. So obviously the ban on contraception had a huge impact on on both men and women in Ireland. And so I suppose on a basic level, it, it meant that men and women couldn't prevent pregnancy or plan, you know, how many children they wanted to have, you know, which is, I think, something that we probably take for granted today in, in society. So yeah, a huge, huge impact in that that way. So this obviously results in women having a fear of pregnancy from month to month, you know, if they are engaging in sexual activity in their relationship. And then that obviously has a huge impact on mental health as well. And there was a study done by a gynecologist in Dublin and Carl Mullen in 1967. And he found that, you know, he kind of looked at the issue of stress in marital relationships and found that the lack of access to contraception had a huge impact on kind of stress within marriages as well. And so it really put a huge strain on relationships. If people weren't able to access um, artificial contraception, then, you know, they were having to use natural methods such as the safe period, which was very unreliable and really depended on having a regular cycle or just abstaining from sex. So obviously that's putting a huge strain on, on people as well. Some of the people that I interviewed for my project on contraception talked about, you know, that this actually had an impact on their marriage breaking up because it just caused so much tension within the marriage. So, yeah, I've I've a few testimonies I can um, share with you from people that I interviewed about their experiences and kind of the impact that the lack of, you know, access to reliable contraception had. So. One woman, Siobhan, who I interviewed, and these aren't their their real names, by the way, they're pseudonyms. Um, so Siobhan was born in 1942, and she said to me, I mean, the contraception thing, it's a pity now, I envy. I would have loved to have known what it was like to have got married and have no children for five years. I would have loved that, and that's the one thing. I shouldn't be having regrets, but I would have loved that. I envy the couple, couples getting married now that can start and, you know, implying, can you, you know, planning their families. I mean, I would have loved that. And then a man called Khan, who was born in 1940, and he grew up in the rural southwest of the country. And he said there was no such thing as family planning in those days or anything else, you know, and it wasn't even a matter for discussion at that stage of life. And it would have been many years before people even discussed these things or spoke about them. It was learned by experience. And that was it, really. You know, that was it. And then another woman I interviewed, uh, Cloda, who was born in 1940, so she um, didn't have access to contraception. And by the age of 28, she had a total of uh, six children, including a set of twins under the age of four. So, yeah, just kind of typical experience. And four years later after that, she had another child and then her um, eighth child was born when she was 46 so that was later on actually but yeah eight children due to kind of lack of access to contraception and she said to me that there was no artificial birth control you had to control yourself or ourselves shall we say so really just that lack of access had a huge impact and just you know the only option if if you couldn't get access to artificial contraceptives was really just abstinence or trying to do the safe period and you also see it in the press as well in the 60s and early 70s there's a lot of discussion about contraception so I've got a quote here from one article from the Sunday Independent in 1966 and um, this is from a father of five and he was writing in about the impact that it had on women's mental health and you know the stress it placed on young Irish mothers so he said he wrote uh, to the independent she doesn't want any more children yet she lies in dread from month to month if she does become pregnant there is a complete escalation in the problems in the home trying to cope with six children while almost physically fit is one thing trying to cope while carrying a seventh is a completely different matter and so it goes to the 11th and 12th so it has huge impact you know just not having that you know, basic option to control how many children that people were wanting to have. There was also even a ban on information about family planning. 
I asked Laura if people after this ban was instituted could even understand the basic fundamentals of how children were conceived and born. Yeah, completely, Finn. So fundamentally, there's no sex education, obviously, in, in this period that I, I've been looking at, you know, so people don't have that kind of basic information. So any kind of information about contraceptive sort of fertility, a lot of the time it's been spread kind of by word of mouth or, you know, women are finding out about it in the 60s and 70s from women's magazines. Often they were a really important source of knowledge. But yeah, that basic information just isn't there. And, you know, obviously it depends then on on class and where you live as well. I think that had an important impact. But, you know, many of, like I interviewed, I think, 105 men and women who were born before 1955 for this project and many of them said that you know they just didn't know anything about birth control and you know one woman I interviewed who was born in the mid 50s she said when you know she was giving birth she didn't know how the actual process yeah how how that was going to happen and so yeah just a real lack of information as well which was really problematic While the state banned contraception, there was also another dynamic at work. The Catholic Church supported this ban, so this left people often torn between their faith on the one hand and decisions about when to have children and even sex on the other. Many people, strange as it sounds, actually went to priests to help them navigate this dilemma. It's a hugely difficult issue for many men and women. You know, if you're brought up in in the Catholic faith and told that sex outside of marriage is wrong, contraception is wrong, you know, all of these things can produce huge guilt around these issues. So I suppose the important thing to mention is 1968, and you've got Humanae Vitae comes in, and that's a papal encyclical, which basically kind of reaffirms the church's position on contraception and they say basically that it's not acceptable artificial contraception is not acceptable and that was a huge disappointment to a lot of catholics around the world because i think people thought in the mid to late 60s that there was going to be a bit of a change in the church's attitudes to contraception you know and that there would be a bit more leniency around this issue so i think that was very disappointing first of all to to a lot of people so what you see yeah, as I said, huge guilt with a lot of people around using contraception. The confession box also becomes an important kind of sphere for people trying to negotiate, you know, their use of contraception. So sometimes people will go to a priest who they think is a bit more lenient around this issue. So for example, in Cork, in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a priest called Father James Good, and he was known for being a lot more progressive, I think, around the issue of contraception. You know, he didn't agree with Humanae Vitae from 1968, and he was quite outspoken on this issue, and it got him in a lot of trouble, obviously, with the church hierarchy. But we know that women in Cork go to him to confess uh, because, yeah, they, you know, he would be more lenient with them on, on the issue. And yeah, and I think the confession box then was also used by some priests as a way to kind of say, I had some women I spoke to who said they would go to the priest and say, you know, the priest would ask them in confession how many children they had. And, you know, one woman said she had two. And there was kind of this silence from the priest. But she kind of from that thought, yeah, got got the message that that wasn't good enough, you know. So that, I think that was an important element as well. But I think it is important as well to remember that there were these dissenting voices within the priesthood, people like James Good, but also younger priests who were being ordained in in the late 60s. And I think some of whom found it quite difficult, you know, when women would come to them um, in the confession box and have all these qualms about using contraception or asking for help if they had, you know, wanted to control their fertility, but didn't want to go about against their religion. So that's important to remember as well. Family planning in general was transformed in the 1960s when the pill had a huge impact. Many have argued that the introduction of the pill was key to women's liberation because it gave them greater autonomy over their own body and when they wanted to have children. However, in Ireland, as you can imagine, it was not straightforward, as Laura now explains. So, yeah, the pill comes into Ireland in 1963 
And actually, the pill is really interesting because it it's there's kind of a loophole, I suppose, with the law around contraception that the pill is marketed in, in Ireland as a cycle regulator. So you see that in other countries like Spain as well in the same period, it's marketed as a cycle regulator too. So this basically meant that women could go to their doctor and say that they had irregular periods or heavy periods or menstrual issues and then get prescribe the pill for for those reasons rather than for for contraception so this information spreads among some women you know that this is a way to actually get access to the pill but obviously it was hugely dependent on your doctor so doctors had a lot of power and authority over who they would give the pill to and you know some of the oral history respondents I spoke to said they felt that they kind of almost had to say they were suicidal or really in an extreme situation before the doctor would actually give it to them so that was really important and then obviously in 1968 when Humanae Vitae comes in I think a lot of Irish doctors then obviously they're Catholic as well then less of them start to continue prescribing the pill because they have all of these qualms around the kind of moral side of it as well but yeah definitely the pill is is really important when that's introduced and I think the fact that it's separate from the act of sex compared to condoms, you know, which were obviously, yeah, it had other kind of associations at the time. The pill could be taken by the woman. It was separate from the act of sex, gave a lot more autonomy to the woman as well in the relationship. But saying that, I think it was still quite difficult to actually find a doctor who would prescribe it. But that knowledge was shared amongst women. The impact of the ban on contraception in Ireland was uneven. Laura explains how it affected people based on class and geography differently. I suppose the main example I'd use would be the family planning clinics. From 1968, you've got the establishment of kind of private family planning clinics around Ireland. First of these is the Fertility Guidance Company in Dublin, which becomes the IFPA, the Irish Family Planning Association. You've also got clinics in other cities like Cork, Galway, Limerick as well. These clinics, they get around the law because they ask patients for a donation rather than actually paying for contraception. So that's how they get around it. And I think when the family planning clinics are set up, the people involved, they're really concerned about the fact that working class men and women don't have access to contraception and they want to prioritise those. But really what happens is it's more middle class people who are actually going to the family planning clinics and getting access. So that's a huge class issue. And also, I suppose, from a geographical perspective then as well, you know, you've got these clinics in the kind of main urban centres, but obviously the rest of the country, it's it's really difficult to get access unless you're able to travel to your local clinic or you're able to order contraceptives from the UK or go over to the UK and bring them back. But again, a risk with that, that they might be picked up by customs as well. So I think class and geographical location are really important as well in terms of thinking about access at this time. The 1970s saw a surge in women's activism and the wider women's movement. And one of the focuses of their activities was this ban on contraception and trying to get it lifted, as Laura explains. The 70s is a really interesting period and it's a really vibrant period in terms of the activism that's going on around this issue. So as I was saying, the late 60s, you've got the Irish Family Planning Clinic. So they're obviously putting pressure on politicians as well. But, you know, you've got Senator Mary Robinson as well, who's really lobbying on this issue in the early 70s. But I think, yeah, the women's movement is really integral to all of this, particularly the Irish Women's Liberation Movement, which is founded in the early 70s and consists of a range of women from different political and working backgrounds. And obviously people such as Nell McCafferty, Maureen de Burka, Mary Kenny, who are really just have the links, I think, in terms of journalism to kind of publicise the issue in the media. This group publish a pamphlet called Irish Women Chains or Change. And that's really important because it kind of sets out all the kind of challenges and inequalities facing Irish women in this period. And they, in that, they publicise the issue of contraception. So the lack of access to contraception in Ireland, the fact that some women are able to get the pill, but it might not be suitable for them, or and I suppose the class inequalities around that as well. So that's really important. You've also got increased discussion in newspapers. So like women's magazines are really important in this period as well, like Women's Way, 
there's constantly articles about the pill and contraception and letters from from women about it so there's a lot of discussion around it so the Irish Women's Liberation Movement some of the activities they do they have a mass like a walkout out of mass in March 1971 and that's in reaction to a pastoral from Archbishop John Charles McQuaid that's read out in the Dublin churches and basically again emphasizing that contraception is wrong so that's a huge kind of public you know display they also have the contraceptive train in May 1971 and that's a huge Hugely important turning point, I think, when you think about the history of contraception. And that's basically where a group from the Irish Women's Liberation Movement took the train from Dublin to Belfast and went to a chemist in Belfast to actually purchase contraceptives and then returned back to Dublin after that. And really, they're kind of highlighting the hypocrisy around the law on contraception in Ireland at the time, you know, that it was possible for some people to actually travel and access contraception if they had the means to do so and that obviously had huge impact you know lots of the people I interviewed remembered that as a really important event it was really publicized in the media at the time and some members of the group went on the Late Late Show afterwards as well so lots of publicity so that's really important but the other group I think is that's important to mention is Irish Women United who are a more radical feminist group who emerged in 1975 and they set up the contraception action program in 1976 and again this was really really important in publicizing the issue so they ran kind of public meetings around contraception they lobbied politicians they also set up an illegal shop selling contraceptives in November 1978 in Harcourt Street in Dublin called Contraceptives Unlimited. So they were doing a lot of these kinds of activities, which again, was really drawing public attention to the issue, highlighting the hypocrisy around the law. And that, I think, was hugely influential as well. The ban was finally lifted in 1979. Charles O'Hay, the then Minister for Health, described lifting the ban as an Irish solution to an Irish problem. I asked Laura what he meant by this and what impact lifting the ban had. I think historians who've have looked at the Irish Family Planning Act have really agreed that it's not a turning point in, in this history at all. And the reason why it's called a um, solution to an Irish problem is that it legalised contraception, but it was kind of widely understood that this legalisation meant that contraception was only available to married couples. That was kind of the understanding around it. And really it was very restrictive because you still needed to have a prescription to get access to contraception. So it placed a lot of power in the hands of medical profession around this issue. And so even things such as condoms, you needed a prescription to get those from your doctor. So again, you know, it means that access is still really restrictive. And it's not until 1985 that that law is amended, which meant that you didn't need a prescription for condoms from 1985, for example. It's not hugely influential, this piece of legislation. And I would argue that not a lot changed actually after 1979 contraception was legal by that point but I think people were still reliant on sympathetic doctor so someone who is going to actually prescribe you contraception and the other issue is that it places a lot of power in the hands of chemists as well so a lot of chemists refuse to dispense contraceptives so if you're living in a rural area for example and there's only one chemist and they don't dispense contraceptives then that makes it really difficult to to get access so I I don't think a huge amount changed I think those class and geographical barriers still remained after 1979 and groups such as the contraception action program they were really disgusted by this piece of legislation and argued that you know these inequalities would remain and they did remain until it was fully liberalized in the early 90s. I want to thank Laura for her time you can follow her on Twitter her handle is linked below You can also find her profile at Strathclyde University, which has links to her publications as well. Until next time, Sloan.